Today we want to cover chapter 5 and chapter 5 gets into cylinder heads and valve train mechanisms and our focus today is going to be mainly on the valve itself but we're going to cover some other things about um, the head itself. So the valve the cylinder head consists of the valve train, the fuel injectors, the camshaft if it has an overhead cam, the valve guides, the seats for the valves, the intake, and exhaust manifolds. These are the components that make up the cylinder head and are attached to it. This is an aluminum head. Now, I don't really want to get into types of material that they have between them. We've already covered the fact that cast iron and aluminum expand at different rates and they have all kinds of advantages and disadvantages and those advantages are the same with the block as they are with the head. So I kind of want to get into the things that are different than what we've already covered. So uh, the only thing I want to say would be aluminum. If you have a problem where the piston comes up and contacts with those valves, it's going to break and scramble that head. So having aluminum heads and having the piston come up and actually hit the valves, you're going to mess it up. So it's going to break. So advantages and disadvantages are the same. Aluminum versus cast iron, we're going to kind of skip that. We already kind of talked about this composite graphite iron that was the same as the block. So I'm going to skip this. You can read about it in your book a little bit more. We've talked about pre-combustion chambers. So pre-combustion chamber is removed and here the pre-combustion chamber is visible. There's coolant passages, so the head has to have space for the valves, has to have space for a pre-combustion chamber if it's an indirect injection. If it's a direct injection, we have to be able to put a little injector in there somewhere, try to fit it into the system. We have to have cooling passages. We still have to cool the top of that head itself, so we have to somehow get cooling around there in between all those objects that are in place. And at some point, somewhere, there's going to be a hole that lets engine oil, oil pressure get up to lubricate the upper end. So if you have upper overhead cam, if you have overhead valves, anything that's up there has to be lubricated. And typically, if you have a turbocharger, you might actually pull it from the top of the head. Sometimes they'll pull it from the side of the block. But anyway, somewhere there's gonna have to be some sort of oil passage that puts oil and pressurized oil up into the top of the head. So all those objects are in this cavity. When we're rebuilding it, we're gonna clean that surface. It's gotta be perfectly flat. We have a little video that we did already on planing or surfacing that head and all the pieces involved in that. We also need to clean those passages. So we want to make sure that all these passages are free of scale, rust, debris, uh, gasket material when we cleaned it, all that kind of stuff. So it's a meticulous cleaning process that needs to be done. And then we're going to deal something, when we get it all clean, then we're going to deal with our valves and we're going to cut our valves, which is kind of our main focus today. So we've already talked about pre-combustion chambers, replaceable seats, and we have the areas that the valves are going to come in and are intake and exhaust. So I kind of want to get to valves. Here's another cutaway that just kind of shows all the different components that you see in the head and how they're trying to fit all these pieces in there. You've got cooling jackets, you've got valves in here, you've got an injector with all the componentry that goes with the injectors and it varies dramatically with different engines. So I don't want to spend a lot of time talking about it, but you can see there's a, a lot of stuff on top of that head. And each one of these has to be sealed, lubricated, cooled, all that. Intake and exhaust, they, they cover a couple of different kinds. There's a lot of different kinds of exhaust and intake arrangements. This one here is a cross flow where it's intake is coming in one side of the head, it goes into my engine, goes out the exhaust, goes out the other side. So it's crossing through the head, goes in one side and out the other. You'll notice here that our valves are at an angle. We have four valves, which is going to be common with virtually all new modern engines. All the tier four compliant engines are really going to four valves. Even the little engines are starting to get four valves. And you notice the little indentations on the piston because the clearance is so tight, they got to give room for those valves to actually go down in there. So it's important that we maintain the proper clearances. This is the parallel port. So we have an intake, 
intakes in the middle of the blue and exhaust can be red so it's coming in one side and coming back out so the intake and exhaust manifolds are on the same side of the head so we're going to flow in and we're going to flow right back out that just puts the two objects really close and they're kind of on top of each other and so they're kind of intertwined here's a couple other designs these are cross flowing the way they're designed but high swirl so the more they curve the more they're going to swirl the more we swirl the more we mix that air and fuel up the better burning we're going to get so here we just have almost no swirl and then here's major amounts of swirl we have no way of altering that as far as technicians we just what do we got so it just kind of gives you an idea of this is a nice to know what are the manufacturer to do? What can we do to, to maintain it? If we have a lot of carbon in here or debris in here, that's going to affect that swirl. So keeping it clean, keeping it smooth, if we're cleaning it and we gouge it and create a disturbance in that wall, it's going to affect how it flows in. So we want to clean and keep it as smooth as possible. Most of what we're working with on both the gas side and the diesel side is not that critical. We're not trying to put this into a race engine and go out there and you know, the difference between winning and losing is one scratch in there. But at the same time, if you understand what race engines are doing and how they're trying to get better performance, as we're cleaning and polishing, we can kind of smooth out some of these edges that are in there that are kind of rough, and we could increase the efficiency of some of these cheap engines that are not, you know, not precision made, and we could polish them up a little bit, and we could actually improve the efficiency, which is going to save us in the end. So the cheaper the engine, the less critical they are about making smooth transitional flowing passageways. So you'll find rough castings that are nasty in there. So if you can kind of polish them out, the machine's going to run better. So that's just what we're going to be dealing with. This is kind of an interesting one. Most engines when they're built if it's a V8 or a V6, the intake manifold is on the middle between the two heads and the exhaust manifolds come out the outside. This one here is the power stroke and it uses reverse flow. The exhaust manifold is in the valley. It's in the middle of the engine and the intakes are on the outside. So the intakes are going to come up and go there and the exhaust is going to come out the middle and hit the turbocharger and then go out very different than most engines that we've seen over years and years of, of technology. Again, nice to know. Cylinder head classifications, we get into multi-piece cylinders and single cylinders, single piece cylinders. Most of our engines are one piece cylinder heads. You get them to large engines, we have a V6, or not a V6, but an inline six. Cummins, they might have you know three different heads, they're individual heads. So it's just kind of a, the way they're set up. If you have one that has wet liners in it, <clears throat> wet liners or even dry liners, there's going to be specifications within your technical manual. These liners should have a slight protrusion and you're gonna lay a straight edge on there, take a filler gauge and you're gonna be measuring how much they stick up. They all need to be the right amount. If you have one that's too high, and you torque it down, you're gonna bend the head, it's gonna crack and damage the head. <clears throat> if it's too low, it's not gonna seal and you're gonna end up blowing the gasket, head gasket out. So if you put liners in, whether they're wet or dry, there's technical specifications that are critical that you follow on how to put them in there. Otherwise, it's gonna get expensive. This would be individual cylinder heads, so this head does two liner, two cylinders, this one does two cylinders. Valve trains, getting into our valves a little bit. We have overhead valve engines and we have in-head valve engines. So I-head would be in-valve or in-head. Um, the valves, rocker arm levers are located in the cylinder heads above the piston and the camshaft and uh, I-head, which in Briggs and Stratton world, I-head is actually, oh, I-head is all in-head. So all those are in there. The other option is going to be in the block. So we could have a camshaft that's in the block. We're gonna have push rods that come up and activating the 
the rocker arms at the top. So this is kind of worded weird. So here's an example, two different examples. This one here, the camshaft lobe, this is an in-head. The cam itself is in the top of the head. You have rocker arms that are directly acting on the camshaft and the other side of the rocker arm is pushing down on the valves, whether it's one valve or two valves. The two of them are right there. The difference is if I have the camshaft down inside the block, then I have to have some sort of a push rod. And that push rod can be pretty long, various materials, expansion rates vary, and I just have this big rod. I have less stuff up here inside the head, and my camshaft can typically run right off the crankshaft. So I'm eliminating chains or belts or whatever is necessary to run the camshaft by getting that camshaft closer to the crank and running it directly off the crank. So it's nice not to have a belt or a chain. So, so there's advantages and disadvantages of both. Three different kinds of drive mechanisms between my crankshaft and my camshaft. You can tell which one's which because a crankshaft runs every revolution. Camshafts are gonna run half the revolution so they're twice as many teeth. So for every revolution of the crank, this one runs half the speed. That's gonna be on your EETC exam. So you'll need to make sure you know that. This one, the two gears are running directly together. When I'm putting the engine together, there's gonna be timing marks. Line up my teeth with my timing marks and go with it. Timing belt, usually some sort of, some kind of rubber, and it's gonna have reinforcing cogs in there. Timing belts tend to be, you need to change them. So there's a set amount of time that needs to be changed. My Volkswagen Jetta diesel engine, every, the original belt was 60,000. Every 60,000 miles, you were supposed to replace the belt. And they changed the belt and moved to 80,000. Then the newest belt, you can go 100,000 before the belt needs to be changed. At about 120,000, if you don't change it, it breaks. When it breaks, pistons are still moving, valve stop moving, valve impacts the piston, top of the engine is a garbled up mess. So not changing a timing belt is very expensive. So it's kind of a pain to change on some applications, but it's critical. Peugeot has a belt. Uh, so Toro products, they used Peugeot for quite some time and they had a belt. And that belt, if you didn't change it on the schedule that they recommended, it wasn't very many hours after that, the belt would break, it would take out, had an aluminum head, pushed all the valves up through the head, get to buy a new head. You couldn't even buy used heads because so many people scrambled the heads. The used heads were impossible to get. You always had to buy a new head, thousands of dollars to buy the new head. So that's a maintenance practice that you don't skip on. Drive chains tend to be a little more durable. Most of the time drive chains don't need to be changed. If you overhaul the engine, you would naturally put new drive chain on. But as far as most of them don't need to be changed because they're metal, they don't stretch as much, and they just tend to last longer. Timing, there's going to be a procedure that every book has on how they time it to where you put the chain and the belt on for proper timing. We're not going to cover that because it's specific to your machine. So this one becomes a maintenance item. <coughs> This is just the Volkswagen 2 liter diesel. So this one's actually similar to mine, which you got a crank down here, and then you got this belt that winds around and it comes up, and here's this overhead cam. So we're trying to time this crank to this cam, and the belt has to go here, and it comes down to here, goes around, goes around this object, and I think it actually goes over this one and goes over this one and comes up here. There's a serpentine belt that's outside. So there's a timing belt on the inside and then there's a serpentine belt on the outside. So this picture is hard to see which one's which. This serpentine belt here is exterior. That's on the outside. There's a timing belt, which is this one back in here. And here it is up there. 
that's on the inside. So it's under a cover, it's gonna have oil on it, it's running in the inside of the engine, and you can't see it. So you can't look at it and say, oh, it's looking like it's starting to be, needing to be changed. They just, and they don't tend to look like they need to be changed. They just get to a point where they just fatigue and they just break. So they don't go like and start separating and you're like, oh, that's looking bad, I need to change it. First of all, you can't see it. Second of all, they just fatigue and just snap. So if you have one with a timing belt, you wanna make sure that you find out what is the service life of it and stay on that schedule. <clears throat> Double roller chain. So this is uh, a newer three liter Volkswagen and they went to a chain. So this one actually has two roller chains and it just looks complicated. Even in your book, it looks complicated. So. And they make a note down here, instead of the chain being at the front of the engine, or the timing chain at the front, this one, the timing chain is at the rear of the engine. So it's got to the point where instead of saying, hey, you know, all timing chains, all timing, but always gonna be in the front. I mean, all these standards that we thought are, this is the way it's always gonna be. They're really mixing things up to make it work for the various applications that we have. And so here's a really different application. So here's your advantages of overhead cams, simplicity, you don't have push rods, everything is up at the top, easier to inspect and service, everything is, take the valve cover off, you can see everything, you're not looking at a camshaft that's down below, and you're going to have lifters that you have to try to see but you can't see. So it's easier to inspect and service, more accurate valve, tra valve train action. And it's gonna be more accurate because you don't have a push rod. A push rod is a long metal rod. When it gets hot, it's gonna expand and you're gonna see a lot of variations. You have a block that's growing and shrinking. So that, that push rod is trying to compensate for that. So having an aluminum block, aluminum head, and then having a metal push rod makes it a challenge to get all that stuff to expand at the same rate to maintain an even valve gap. So they're a lot more a lot more accurate with an overhead valve. Optimized intake and exhaust passageways for easier breathing. They can also go in there and, and put those valves at angles and open them so that the flow flows better. So instead of worrying about Okay, you got a push rod coming out, so my rocker arm has to go here, valve has to go straight in. Now I can actually change the angle. So they have a little more freedom at the, at the engineering point to optimize these passageways. And then higher injection pressures. I think overhead valves can handle higher uh, pressures within the cylinder. Different kinds of valves, we have poppet valves, two and four valves per cylinder or is the common. In the diesel world, four valves is almost going virtually every engine is going there. To get to emissions, to get the proper flow in and out, most everything is going to four valve. So my understanding, and it's changing so fast it's hard to keep up, but my understanding is virtually every new tier four diesel has four valves. So there may be some exceptions. For the most part, they're all gonna be four valve. So having five valves, I don't know that we will see five valves in our engines because they're so small. It's gonna be hard enough to get four valves. To get five valves would be very challenging. As the pistons get larger, the engines get larger, five valves is not that uncommon. So depends on what they're trying to do. You look at five valves, that's just more things to try to open and close, more valve seats and valves to clean up. It's just a lot of complications. Four smaller valves rather than two large intake and exhaust valves are used. And uh, they do that so that they can get more air in that way. So they're optimizing more of it. We'll put a direct injector right in the very middle, put four valves all the way around it, and it works better. Going away from indirect injection, indirect where you had the pre-combustion chamber coming in from the side, it was hard to get four valves in there because one side had the pre-combustion chamber. Going to direct injection where it's in the middle or slightly off to the middle, it's easier to go with four valves. 
So this is our pre-combustion chamber. In this case, we can only use two valves. Just like in the gas engines, exhaust valves are always going to be smaller than intake. It's easier to push exhaust out than it is to bring it in. And when we open up the engine, do we suck air into our intake? No. So just like in the gas class and the gas engines, atmospheric pressure is pushing in there. The piston traveling down creates a low pressure area and air is pushed in by atmospheric pressure. And I want to emphasize that because if my, if my uh, air filter is dirty, really, really dirty, not just dirty, if it's really dirty, atmospheric pressure can't push itself through it. And so we create this big negative pressure in the, in the combustion chamber and atmospheric pressure can't do its job to push it in. If you have leaks in your intake manifold, the exhaust valve, exhaust air filter is dirty, then it's going to push dirt in through any crevice and crack that it can. So atmospheric pressure is what's pushing it in there. We speak a lot about it sucking air in, but it helps if you understand it really is being pushed in, not sucked in. If my intake is blocked off or it's really dirty, piston travels down, if atmospheric pressure can't fill that void, that valve or that cylinder will not have any fresh air in it. It's going to come back up. It's not going to be any oxygen. We put fuel in it. We're not going to burn. We're going to see a lot of black smoke. <clears throat> so intakes, because it's harder for atmospheric pressure to push it in, we're only pushing it in at 14.7 psi on a perfect day in the perfect area. It's hard to push it in, whereas exhaust, that piston is traveling up it pretty much is going to force it out. So you can push it out a couple hundred pounds. We just can't suck it in, draw it in. Atmospheric pressure can't push it any more than atmospheric pressure. That's why we go to turbochargers. Rather than relying on atmospheric pressure as you start to climb up a mountain, 14.7 goes less and less. We get up at 5,000 feet. All of a sudden, man, my car has no power. Well, it has no power because I have no air. And this has no air because I can't, I don't have any atmospheric pressure to push it in. Go to a turbocharger, now I'm actually going to push it in, I'm actually going to force it in, give myself more oxygen, now my diesel engine works again. Same is true with a gas engine, it's just not as noticeable on a gas engine, it's very noticeable on a diesel. <clears throat> angles, so we're starting to get into the valves where we want to see, valve angles are machined at an angle to wedge themselves between the seat and the valve to improve sealing. There's valve guides. The valve guides are located either integral with the cylinder head casting or they're replaceable. So it depends on whether it's a really expensive machine that they expect you to rebuild or not or what the material is. If it's an aluminum head and a diesel engine, we're gonna put a metal insert to give it more durability. So it depends on what they wanna do. It's either gonna be machined as part of it or a separate piece. <clears throat> so this is where I wanna get into, and we're gonna go look at a couple of heads. So before we look at the heads, <clears throat> we have our valve itself. Our valve is gonna be ground on a machine that we have sitting over here. So we'll show you some examples of different valve grinders. So the valve itself is going to have a smooth one angle uh, face on it. And that valve face is going to typically be 45 degrees on both intake and exhaust. Exhausts are always going to be 45. Intakes are usually 45. So there are some exceptions. You would want to reference back to your manual. And then the valve seat, typically you have a different seat. We have a valve contact surface, contact with the valve face, from a valve face on the, on the valve seat, there's a width. And one of the examples that we're going to show you is one that has a really wide width. And how do we change that? And we're going to change it by giving a three angle grind. This angle up here is like 30 degrees. This one is 45, and this is a 60 degree angle. We're going to use the 30 and the 60 degree angle to manipulate the area that the valve seat touches the valve itself. And we want the valve itself 
to be touching with one third no contact on the top and then the valve seat the physical contact is going to be the lower two-thirds. If you contact way out on the outer edge of the valve, puts the pressure on the outer valve, and that valve gets hot, it starts to actually bend the valve and actually wears the valve out. So to give it greater strength, we're going to seat it not in the middle, but in the uh, slightly above center. That's where we're going to shoot for, and we'll see that a little closer over there. So if we're going to narrow it with a 60, we narrow the top with the 30. Terminology over here, we have the valve tip face. This piece here is what's a, uh, our valve rocker arm is touching or whatever is actually opening the valve is going to be touching. That has to be smooth. We can actually surface that on our grinder over here, make sure it's smooth. There's a groove up here or a hole or some kind of object up here and that's what actually holds the valve stem or the valve spring down, so there's some kind of a clip or a wedge component in there. Some of the gas engines have an actual pin that goes through. But there's gotta be something, and this groove up here is what actually holds that cover that the spring is held in with. You have a shaft, you have a valve stem, typically it's called the valve stem. This is the area that's riding within the guide. The head is down here, top of the head, my seat, and then valve margin. Valve margin is another very important name that you need to know. If this valve margin, which is between what's actually ground and the top of the head, if that valve margin gets too narrow, the valve will start to bend and actually wear away. So we have to maintain a certain amount of margin to keep enough strength to keep the valve from actually damaging. So that's going to be an important name. In your tech manual, there will be a line item that says valve margin. And you're going to measure it. And it's kind of a pain to measure, but you can measure it. So I think we're going to go look at those things. Before we look at them, I guess this is your integral. This is one where they just machine the valve guide and the valve sits in the valve guide. This is all machined in there. And here's one with a replaceable valve guide. So we're going to turn now and go to these valves. So we're going to start with this one. This is a diesel head that Mike is working on. We have three things that we want to point out. We have three different intake valves here. The first one hasn't been touched. We haven't done anything to it. The second one, we just lapped it. We cleaned it up put the valve in there and lapped it. And if you look carefully, hopefully we'll see this on our video there, but this part of the valve is a gray. It's a dull gray. And that dull gray is where the lapping compound actually contacted the seat and actually was you know, wearing it away. This side over here is still kind of shiny and it's not gray. And what's happening is we went to lap it and the valve is touching on this side of the seat and not on this side. When we put some liquid in there, this valve leaked. So we actually have valve leakage here and somehow our valve guide has gotten off from the seat. So we need to keep machining the seat itself to try to get the seat centered with the valve guide. And we're either going to take and cut it with a cutter, try to cut it back over here or keep lapping it until we can machine this side down until it touches all the way around. So it's going to be a process where we're going to try a couple of things. <clears throat> this one on here, this third seat, we actually lapped it. It has the same problem where this is kind of a dull area. The valve lapping compound was touching here. It did not touch over here. We still have some black carbon buildup and it's still shiny because there's no contact. If we put liquid in here again this one would leak on this side here. <clears throat> the other thing that we did to this one is our valve width is really wide. So this particular engine our valve seat width is 51 thousandths to 71 thousandths and 51 thousandths is pretty narrow 71 thousandths is pretty wide so we'll lay this on here this is 71 thousandths and then we'll go down here to about 51. So you can see how 
wide that is on our, on our dial caliper here. It's pretty narrow. When we measure the width, and we're going to measure it on this one over here, we're simply going to put this on, and you have to arbitrarily kind of figure out what it is. And this particular seat is about 70,000. So right now, we're right at the maximum for the seat width. And because it's at the maximum, as it wears, it's gonna go beyond maximum. We're kind of rebuilding it. We wanna bring it closer to the bottom end. To do that, what we're gonna do, or what we did do on this one, is we used a smaller 60 degree seat cutter. We put our little adjusting tool or our pilot guide in here. So we put the pilot guide in there, anchored it down tight, we took a 60 degree cutter, we put it in there, and he actually cut the bottom part of that valve. Now we've narrowed up the valve margin and it's gonna be narrower. What I wanna be able to show you here is the same thing that we found when we actually did the lapping. On this side, that narrowing, that 60 degree, is almost just a non-existent line. You can't hardly see the line. As the line continues to go around, it gets wider and wider on this side over here. And the, because the valve seat is actually off to one side, and it's not lined up with our valve, everything is off. And so going back with a seat cutter, kind of getting the whole thing realigned with itself will allow us to get to a point where we can uh, get it to seat better. Here's the valve. So I'll try not to move it there. And this is what the valve looks like when we just lapped it. So we put it in and we lapped it. And you can see we've got the dull gray area where the lapping compound was touching, we have untouched area on the top, untouched area on the bottom. The untouched area on the top is narrower than the bottom, but there is a distance. So like one third, that's our one third rule where we go one third in, and then we're gonna start touching. This particular one, when we do the 60 degrees, we wanna kinda narrow up from the bottom. We don't want to go any further down from the top, so we'll take a little bit off the bottom and try to make our width a little narrower. We could also, after lapping it, we could use the same method and actually measure how wide is our valve seat. And again, we're this is about 80 thousandths. So this is right just past the maximum width that we can have. So it's very easy for you to see how much contact surface we have. And so we wanna narrow that up. Because we already lapped this and it's dull gray, the only way we would know by narrowing the seat that we're now narrower is to take this to the valve grinder and polish that off and then come back and recheck it. So once we've kind of scratched up with the lapping compound, then we're pretty much done. You can't unlap it and make it look different. So those are part of the tools that we have. If for some reason we decided, well, we want to take the top end off, then we would go to a wider one and we don't have, this is a 45, we need to go closer to 60 and I don't have one on the table here a 60 degree and try to cut the top. Luckily for us, because I don't know that we have a 60 degree that fits in this particular small engine, uh, luckily we don't really need to take the top off. So we just want to take a little off the bottom. We want to get the 45 part angled back over where it belongs and we're going to let it go. So those are kind of the, the things that we're doing. If I was off like that, what I'd want to do is there's a valve guide cleaner so you take a wire brush a round wire brush make sure that my valve guide is clean if there was carbon buildup in there that could be holding my valve off to one side so before i alter this a lot i want to make sure my valve guides are clean and we've already cleaned our valve so we're going to actually cut it now and actually check it so moving over we have another head and this particular head here is a gas engine same thing 
a gas engine and a diesel engine, you do exactly the same method. Everything is the same. This particular one, we used a valve cutter. We actually cut it. We cut it at 46 degrees. That's what our cutter is. We measured our valve guide to see what our margin, or not our guide, but our margin. Our margin is at 89 thousandths. 89 thousandths is really wide. We go to our technical manual. The technical manual says 20 to 43 thousandths. So we're way beyond what is acceptable for this engine. So now we're going to go ahead and we're going to use the 60 degree, do a little bit on the inside. You'll notice that this 60 degree is not going to work, so we can't do that. Before we do that, we want to see where is the valve seat touching on the valve guide. We actually measured our valve, the top of the valve, and we measured the width up here at the top. And what we found is this guide is actually touching all the way to the outside of the valve. And that's not a good situation. So we're actually going to try to bring the top down instead of the bottom in. So this other engine, we took the top, we took the bottom in. This one, we're going to take the top in. So 45, because it's 45, we're going to go back in here with a 30 degree. And we're going to cut the top with 30 degrees. And bring that top in. And try to get that margin narrower. So we're going to continue with the slideshow while we're doing that. Scott is going to bring that top in so that you can see what that looks like. So, what's that? How's that? So right now it's all one shiny surface. It's all the same. When we cut it, you should see a distinct difference between the top and the bottom. Okay. And this is a booklet that kind of goes through and just kind of gives you an idea of what we're looking for proper width and location. On a gas engine, we typically want a, di a, a difference between the valve seat and the valve itself. So most gas engines, we want a one degree interference angle, or this technical manual is calling for a half a degree interference angle. So the valve seat is going to be, let's say 45, then the valve itself would be a 46 or a 44. So we would do something slightly different. Our valve seat cutters that we're using is a 46. Because it's a 46, the valve itself we cut at a 45 or a 45 and a half. So we have a half a degree interference angle. So we always want it slightly different. On diesel engines, you want the same. So the seats and the valves are both 45. Over here, is just another example like the one on the wall 31 degrees they have a 46 degree and a 30 degree and then the valve itself is a 45. doing a three angle grind bringing each of those edges at a different angle is what will help the transition is that air flows in here the more angles you have the smoother the transition, the airflow through here, and the more efficient this engine's gonna be. If you were into hot roads and racing, there would be a very, very smooth transition all the way through. So that piston porting, where they go in and smooth all those surfaces, make sure everything lines up perfectly, and there's no square edges, nothing for the air to run into, it's gonna give you maximum efficiency. We're not trying to do this for efficiency, we're just trying to do it to get the valve seat to contact the valve in the proper area. Over here on this side, this is my valve guide. When I put this guide pin down the center, I want to make sure that it sits in there most, almost all the way. So we don't want it sticking way up and we don't want it to stick too far down. They want it to only have about 1 8 to 5 8 of an inch sticking out. And that helps this guide that we're using to be centered. And the kit that we're using has lots of guides in it. We'll show you guides here in a 
in a few minutes. So while Scott's doing what he's gonna do, we're gonna continue with valves on the screen. I need my little clicker. So flatter, more uniform, three angle grind is gonna give you reduced wear, improved airflow, better heat transfer. So you want it to be nice and smooth. If you have a valve seat that's too high on the valve, the further out on the valve, the further the heat has to travel before it's going to transfer into the head. And so we don't typically think of valves and valve seats as heat transfer, but this valve is gonna be hot. It's in the combustion chamber, it's gonna get hot. The heat is transferred through the valve stem and through the valve face. If that valve face is not contacting properly and not contacting enough, the heat will not be transferred. The, heat, the valve will overheat and then it will start to distort. So as the metal gets too hot, becomes semi-plastic, it'll actually just start moving and bending. Your valve clearance is going to get off, it's going to start leaking, and you're going to have all kinds of problems. So that valve clearance is pretty critical. Look at the top side, we have valve springs. Underneath the spring on the intake side will be a valve seal. Some engines have valve seals on both intake and exhaust, some just have it on intake. On the exhaust side, because this valve guide is pressurized, you have exhaust gases that are going out, it's pressurized, we're not going to actually push or pull oil in. We're gonna be pushing exhaust gases could go up that valve stem and get up into my engine and in my combustion chamber. That's gonna contaminate my oil, but it's not actually gonna get oil down into my engine. On the intake, because we're creating a low pressure area, if your air filter starts to get really dirty, as the air filter gets dirty, we're gonna start pulling air, atmospheric pressure is gonna be pushing air in any place they can find, and this is one of the areas that it will actually start pushing air into. So it goes down the valve guide, when the air goes down the intake, the valve guide, it's gonna carry oil with it because we're saturating all this with oil. And I'm actually gonna push oil into my engine and you start burning oil. So you got blue smoke going out. With modern engines, modern tier four in the diesel world, these things are going to affect the catalytic converter, your, your filtration system, that whole after treatment system is gonna be in, impacted by that oil that's in there. And it may not be the valves, it could just be the valve guide, or it could be these valve seals are improperly sealing, they could be bad. So anytime I take it apart, you do a head job, you're always gonna replace these seals. They're pretty simple, pretty inexpensive. So it should be a part of every kit. Don't be lazy and just not replace them. So even if you're not gonna be messing a lot with your valves, you still wanna replace these seals just because it's a simple thing to do. And it is one source of oil into your engine you don't want. Valve seat inserts. Premium diesel engines have replaceable valve guide inserts because if I overhaul the valves or replace my valves, I can push new valve seats in and makes my valve sit in there perfect. I don't have any wear, the valve's not slopping around, and you have a reduced chance of leakage. Valve seat itself typically has three angles and it's not every valve. I've seen a lot of engines I've taken apart where they just have the inserts pressed in there and they just have the 45 and the three angles not always in every valve seat but you want to check to see do I need to put the three valve angle on there to make it uh, contact better. <laughs> so it's your job to kind of check all that. This is just an example of what happens when a valve gets too hot or something goes wrong and it breaks. Then that valve falls into the top of the head, it's on top of the piston, and it's cramming itself up. And you can see how we have a nice looking cylinder here, and this one is all beat up. So that valve can't go anywhere, so it's just in there and it's punching holes through the top of the piston, and it's punching holes through the top of the head, and it's punching holes into my valve seat, and it pretty much wipes out my head. So the chance of me fixing this is pretty much not gonna happen. 
So most likely if you tried to save it and you didn't have a bunch of cracks up here, you would have to pull the valve seat out, insert a new one, press a new one in, and then recut them. But most of the time the damage is so extensive that you can't do that. So having a valve break because you did something wrong is not a good thing. Here's a one that prolonged idle. This one had a buildup of slobber on this valve stem, so we had a lot of carbon buildup that start building up on it, and then the valve actually starts sticking in the valve seat. And when it's stuck, it's stuck in the open position. Piston comes up, strikes it, bends the valve. So like that day that I was working on that John Deere 1445 on the deck, I was trying to fit the deck in out there. And I left it nailing so I could move the deck up and down to get it in. And then you came out and shut it off. Is it, was that is that not good to leave it sitting there idle while I'm trying to do the deck? No. It's going to be even more important as we get into tier four because excessive idling for our tier four is going to be what plugs up the particulate filter because at an idle it burns so poorly. Our combustion process is so poor. No, because it's not. It's not. Because you have very little air. Or you have lots of air but very little fuel so instead of this molecule burning and contacting the next fuel mo and burning to the next one there's spots where this one will burn but it doesn't transfer the fire into the next molecule and so it just doesn't burn you have a lot more blow by past your rings which we already talked about and then just the fact that you have such a so low amount of fuel the other thing is such low fuel such low fire it's very cold and a cold combustion chamber doesn't burn very efficient all of that leads to some unburnt fuel that sticks to my valves, sticks to my, in it, my exhaust system, goes through the exhaust pipe, and it's going to gum things up. So if you're just sitting there idling for an hour and you're not really doing anything or even a half an hour, you're really doing a lot of damage to the engine. If, if you're going to be making an adjustment every you know, minute or two minutes, then you keep it running. But in some cases, you're better off instead of running at an idle, full throttle. not full throttle, but bring it up. Remember, go up to a thousand RPM. So if I have a cold engine and I want to do a warm up for a cold engine, bring it up to a thousand. Idling at a 500, 500 to 700 is a common. So bring it up to a thousand, put a little more fuel in there, get a little more RPM. It'll stay a little bit warmer. It'll burn more efficient. We'll have less blow by at, at the idle and actually have less damage. So bringing the idle up would be a better situation. Most people don't do that because, hey, it's noisier, well, but it's actually better on the engine. So these kind of things are actually could cause it. We see this in the gas engines where the fuel is bad. It's varnished, it's stale fuel. The stale fuel comes and hits this valve and the valve is kind of warm and that stale fuel just kind of globs on it so it's like spraying varnish on there instead of going on there and vaporizing it's so thick and so gooey that it hits the valve solidifies and kind of bakes on there just like this and then that valve will stick in the seat you have a rocker arm that's trying to push the valve down but the valve is stuck in the seat and either the piston hits the bottom or it's stuck in the up position and then the valve rocker arm can't move so you push the bend the, you, you bend your push rods or you snap off the rocker arm at the top so you damage the some part of that drive chain system you may actually stick it in the open position piston my hand it and bend the valve itself so in gasoline engines it's stale fuel that does a terrible number on this and causes that problem we've had that problem three times in the last two years where a customer brought a machine in two of them from the same customer that two different machines both of them were Briggs and Stratton engines both of them had stale fuel put in them both of them the valves stuck and bent the push rods so getting the same customer with two machines that was kind of amazing we had another one that was a Kohler engine John Deere Kohler engine and the guy brought it in and the valve was stuck open he put some stuff on, took a hammer and was pounding on it, which damaged the valve even more. And uh, so then he gave up, brought it to us. 
we actually took it and we actually had to pound. We took the mushroom off the top and we had to actually pound the valve out. So we soaked it for two days on some pretty good stuff that usually loosens it up and it did not loosen it up. And we ended up having to beat it out. Once we got it out, the valve seat around the valve was fine. The valve guide was fine after we got the varnish out and we were able to free it up, put new valves in and it actually worked fine. So slobbering, idling, carbon buildup, those are all problems that can happen in my valve system. I don't know. Could be on the EETC test. I don't know. So valve insert, you have your cylinder head itself. They machine a spot in there and then you would press your insert in and then you're going to grind that valve seat to whatever is appropriate. It's not very often that you're going to do that particular task. So it's a pretty rare event. If you have a situation where you have to replace this, typically there's a lot of other damage and a lot of times it wipes out the whole head. But it is possible some engine blocks, the head is designed to where if you ground this too far, so you start grinding, weren't paying attention, you change the 60 or the 30 or the 45 too much, and you get to a point where, oh man, I just messed it up. Most of them are, it's possible to pull them out, press new ones in, and start all over. The new one's gonna have a very, very small seat, and you may have to cut the seat down a ways to get it to, to fit properly. But they give you lots of metal there to get your angle correctly. And typically, you would wanna take that to a machine shop, and they would put that in. So. If you're confident enough, you could do it yourself. Not too many people will do that. So blue smoke from the worn valve guides. We talked about the guide itself being worn without that seal on there. Oil is being drawn down the valve stem and you start burning oil. It could be from that valve guide. And so idling. So we just talked about idling and valve damage. Springs. The springs are what hold that valve seat closed and it has to maintain tension on it. There are tools out there that measures free length. You take your valve spring, you put it in this tool and it measures free length. You can take a, like a 90 degree T-square and you can actually measure it. And so the tool is doing the same thing. The difference is a lot of your manuals will say, okay, here's the free length of the valve. And then at, let's say, from a one and a half inch, bring it down one inch. And at one inch, how much tension does the spring apply? And so it's a spring pressure tester. So you bring it down to whatever length they tell you, how much pressure is being applied on the needle, and has my spring actually lost its tension? You do that same thing on all gas engines and diesel. They're all the same. You, spray, you check spring tension. So if you suspect there's a problem, it's a special tool that measures free length and spring tension at a given length. So that's a, a part of the service that you're doing. So if the valve spring is wore, you see some wear on it, you probably should just replace it. It's not something you, you want to mess with too much. The valve itself is cooled. The excessive heat must be removed. And that's that valve seat. It has to have contact to remove the valve, the, the heat from the valve. Another thing is the keepers. So that groove we showed you earlier, this is a two-piece keeper system. You would press this down, two keepers go one on each side, and then that piece here slides up over top of them that wedges in there. As it wedges, the more pressure you have, the more it wedges in and that keeps it from actually coming apart. So to get it apart, you just slide this part down and reach in there with a magnet, pop those two pieces out. It's pretty cheap to replace these two little keepers. If these keepers snap off, there's just a little groove that fits in here. If they snap off and those pop out, the valve is going to fall down inside the engine. So it's not gonna go out, it's gonna go in. So piston's traveling down on the intake stroke, it's going sucks the valve in, then the valve comes back up, it's not in the guide, and then it cramps it. 
And so most of the time, most rebuilds, you just put the valve keepers back on unless you look at them and you're like, well, this thing's getting worn. So, but it's one of those things where it's such a cheap item, it's really not worth re-putting re back in old ones. You really should just, you buy a new valve, you buy new gaskets and gaskets and seals, and you would just kind of add that additionally to your, your expense and just replace those. So that's just a, a good maintenance practice to do. I have a friend of mine who's got a combine that they did a $10,000 overhaul on an engine and I think they got about 50 hours out in the field and these keepers snapped off, sucked a valve, whoo, took out a $10,000 engine. So it's kind of an expensive little keeper if you look at the replacement of that keeper was $10,000. You know, to spend $18 on some keepers is pretty cheap. So it's one of those, it just adds to the bill, but that's cheaper than losing the, losing the engine. So here's my valve seal. We have a dampener spring. This particular one has a spring inside the spring. And then we have a valve rotator. So a valve rotator, the purpose of that, valves themselves are designed to rotate. They don't just go in and out. As they go in and out, they should rotate. And that kind of helps move the heat, transfers the heat, and keeps the wear moving around. Looking at the head on the table that we had, we lapped it, and we were lapping it. Contact was on one side and not on the other. No heat will transfer on this side. All the heat would only transfer on, one, on the opposite side. That's a bad thing. If the valve didn't rotate, we could polish it in, and the valve could be lopsided, and we can get it to do that, but that's not a good thing. And the valve is never going to rotate and get it, the heat to transfer out. By lapping it, noticing that we're cutting on one side only, that lets us know that, hey, we need to do something to get this thing back into a circle so that we can actually rotate the valve. We noticed on the valve itself that the gray part was all the way around the valve because when they lapped, they lapped and spun the valve 100% 100% all the way around. The seat pattern was the same because the single point of the area that it was touching touched the same area. But looking at the seat, that's where we noticed that the seat itself wasn't being touched all the way around. So we want to be careful about that and we need to address that situation. Here's another rotator. This rotator actually has little ball bearings on the inside. And so if you actually held it in your hand and rotated it, it would actually rotate pretty freely. Not every valve is going to have a ball bearing style rotator. Most of them just have a solid keeper on the top and the bottom. And just when they move, they actually will slowly rotate. This one helps force it or make it easier for it to rotate and transfer that heat you would want to make sure that those are smooth, that they're not catching. They can get grit in there and cause problems or they can just get pitting that takes place and then they're not rotating smooth. Replace them. They're Again, they're a cheap item compared to a $10,000 overhaul. Valve actuating mechanisms. Most valves just... Uh, most valves actually have just a lifter that's riding on the camshaft. They're saying most valves are actually using roller type cam followers and lifters, roller rocker levers to reduce friction. Maybe on modern high speed expensive engines we're seeing that, but when you spend less money on it and the, and the machine is used in a lower application, lower value application, you're not going to see roller cam bearings. You're just going to see a lifter that's riding on top of the camshaft. So roller type lifters and followers reduce friction. Anytime you can use a roller rock, rock uh, roller cam follower, it's going to ride on there easier. It's going to be easier to, to run it over. Reduce friction, improves fuel economy. So every little bit adds up. We're going to see these roller type lifters on the camshaft the fuel pump itself. <coughs> so this one only has one left, but again here, 
we have a roller on the fuel pump itself. So that's common, but on the exhaust and intake valves, we don't see that roller action. Here's a roller one that looks like the one in that fuel system. So this has a roller, runs on a smooth hip type. This is more commonly what we're going to see, and that's just a solid lifter, mechanical lifter. Camshaft comes around, it's going to lift it up and down. We would want to make sure that this surface, so there's a measurement, make sure that's flat. You'd also measure to see that there's wear on the sides. So your book is going to go through with lots of measuring to make sure we don't have a lot of wear. These don't wear as much because they're rollers, but the rollers can wear. Make sure they're not excessive movement. And again, you would measure for side wear. This is a hip type. So we have a camshaft that's in the block. We have a hip type that goes to this point, and then this is a push rod. So this thing is just lifting up. We have a guide in there for that hip style to go in, and then the valve camshaft is just pushing on it. Push rods, they're the ones that transmit cam action force into the rocker arms themselves. It can either be solid, oh, they can be different types of metal, and they can either be pushing on, let's go back again. So here we have this hip style that's solid, we can also have a hip style that has um, non-adjustable. They automatically adjust. So I'm trying to think of the name of the lifter that pumps itself up. The style that you have, what's it called? Hydraulic lifters. Hydraulic lifters. So we can have hydraulic lifters here where this actually will pump up with engine oil and that will actually may we don't have to actually adjust the valves or we can have solid ones so this one here hydraulic lifters is what they're talking about so we have push rods different metals make sure that they're they're round the way to check a push rod to see if it's round is just get a level surface like a tabletop or a floor and just push the rod across the floor so you lay down flat and just push on it and it'll just roll across so if one end is bigger, it'll just kind of roll in an arc. If there's a any kind of bend in that rod at all, it'll go room, 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 room. So it'll actually be kind of jerky and it'll stop and it'll kind of rock. So it's really easy to lay them on there, just kind of flick it and it should just roll across the table and stop. If it kind of jerks, they're bent. So it's pretty easy to check. Make sure the two ends are not excessively worn. So you look at it, if they look worn, you would replace them. Hydraulic lifters, they maintain zero valve backlash. I'm using engine oil to actually hydraulically keep all the backlash out. I don't have to do any kind of a valve adjustment before you put them in. There's a process that you would go through and make sure that you bled them, make sure they have oil in them. Because there's no lash, it minimizes engine noise and eliminates another maintenance requirements for you. I don't know how many, most of the compact diesel engines that we've been working with do not have hydraulic lifters. This Onan that we looked at earlier, this Onan has hydraulic lifters. Onan and Kohler both use a lot of hydraulic lifters. The rest of the manufacturers tend to use solid lifters. So. So exhaust valve train wear, we talked about that. Rocker arms, we talked about the rocker arms. They have crosshead yokes and valve bridges and there'll be some pictures of those. So we'll skip that for now. And then camshafts, control gas dynamics, engine breathing characteristics. So the lobe itself on a camshaft is going to determine how long and how much an engine is going to breathe. These are non-adjustable crosshairs used on a Cummins. And so these are an arm, there's a better picture coming up, that goes between them. And we're gonna be pushing both valves at the same time. Hmm. 
We already see those pictures? Might have already seen them. So this arm here goes between two valves. The rocker arm itself is pushing on that bridge and the bridge is opening two valves at the same time. So we just have one rocker arm and one bridge. Sometimes they'll have two rocker arms, one on each valve. So there's lots of variations. The lobe itself, this is all controlled by the manufacturer. This curve, the shape of that curve, all determines when the valve opens, how long it opens, all that kind of stuff. So like in the automotive world, if I want to get into racing, I can get racing cams. Racing cams are altering this curve, this closing and opening ramp and the height of the nose. And that changes the duration of the valve, how long it's open, and all that kind of stuff. And it changes the dynamics of the engine. I know that I used to have a Honda Civic with a VTEC engine in it. And in the VTEC engine, the camshaft has a hydraulic cylinder on the a little plunger and as the engine oil got up to a certain temperature or a certain pressure it actually pushes the whole camshaft down and there was a double set of cam lobes the cam lobes actually changed and as it moves over the valve lobes would be a different lobe and on my car if I just stepped on the accelerator, it would go until it hit 4,000 rpms at 4,000 rpms you would just sit you back on your seat you could feel the difference when that camshaft pushed over and it changed the dynamics of it it would sit you back and the rpms would just boom hit 6,000 just like that and so it go boom, and you had to be shifting then so it's amazing if you were trying to race in that car you would be playing with that 3500 to 6,000 rpms and that car it moved so but it actually hydraulically moved the whole camshaft lengthwise so that you were actually pushing on a different cam lobe. That's how they accomplished it. Overlap, the angle and the crankshaft degrees at the point that both the intake and exhaust valves are open. We're gonna see that little wheel that comes up. And uh, look at that, it's pretty critical. They talk about in your book, there's a tech tip talking about soot loading and the intake manifolds. Even a normal engine without gas recirculation that we're seeing with this new tier four, even in a normal operation, and the intake valve opens, sometimes soot will be pushed into the intake and you'll see build up in the intake manifold from just kind of some spit back kind of uh, application. If you have a car like mine that has exhaust recirculation, where they're taking exhaust, putting it back in, my intake manifold was completely packed. It went from this big of a hole to like this size of a hole. So I'm like, well, how's my engine supposed to breathe when it can't get air? I mean, it was incredible how bad it was and how much soot that I took out of it. So that's a a problem the engines that have that system they do a lot with the types of materials and trying to deal with that abrasive soot that's going in there but the reality is it's just got to be hard on the engine so it's not something that I like to see but we do it because of emission standards isn't the soot that gets blown back up the intake valve without needing guard in the system is that from valve overlap it's from the valve overlap. So at some point, the intake and the exhaust valve are gonna be open at the same time, which we're gonna see here. So all valves, and this is true, gas engines, diesel engines, you have this wheel, that's the different degrees that goes on. And you'll notice that the exhaust valve doesn't wait till the piston hits the bottom of the stroke. If we waited till it was at bottom dead center, and then, okay, let's open the exhaust valve, we would be going back up with our piston long before the valve got open. It takes time for a valve to open both intakes and exhaust. So all valves will open and close before we really want them to. So exhaust valve is going to open clear over here, 67 degrees before bottom dead center. The exhaust valve will begin to open. And so that when it hits bottom dead center, it is fully open. And then it will stay open until 27 degrees after top dead center. 
So we're going to be going there. We're going to give that time for that exhaust valve, exhaust gases to go out. We're also going to utilize this rushing out of exhaust gases. It's going to create a greater low pressure area. The greater low pressure area will help draw in the intake side. So the valve overlap is that point in which the valve intake and the exhaust valve are both open at the same time. One is opening and one is closing. But at some point they're both going to be open. And we're going to be utilizing this exiting low vacuum and to help draw my intake in. Intake valve, it's going to open 30 degrees before top dead center. So the point is it's going to open before. So it's beginning to open so that at top dead center it's fully open and then it's going to stay open until 54 degrees after top dead center or after bottom dead center. And so even though we're going up on the in, we're going up on the compression stroke, the intake valve is still open because air when it moves has mass and when it has mass it's hard to get it to stop. So even though the piston is starting to travel back up, the air is still moving into the cylinder and it just gives you an extra amount of time for that air to go push and it actually compounds and packs into the engine and it packs more air in there. And what they're illustrating with this diagram is this, this is a much larger valve overlap than some and they're saying it's because of the turbocharger. So the turbocharger is packing more air in during an intake stroke. We got this engine that's pushing air in, so now instead of just you know atmospheric pressure and then just mass air mass pushing it in, we have a turbocharger pushing it in. So we have a bigger overlap here with this particular situation. <coughs> not function properly if it's not. If you took the turbocharger off, we would see a lot of spit back, see a lot of soot in our intake manifold because as the piston starts to travel back up, it's going to start building up pressure. You're going to start seeing some stuff go back up on the intake manifold. So you wouldn't want this cam set up. You put the wrong camshaft in an engine that was turbocharged or non-turbocharged. A lot of times it's the same block. The smallest size is non-turbocharged. The larger sizes will have turbochargers. If you put the wrong camshaft in this engine, you would have problems with it. It would not run right. Once the intake valve closes, so it comes to this point where it closes, the valves will stay closed all the way till it gets over to here. So there's a point where I'm going up on the compression stroke, we inject fuel up in this area, it fires 10 degrees after top dead center, we get maximum expansion, we're going to push the piston down, at 67 degrees before bottom dead center, the exhaust valve is going to begin to open and we're going to start relieving that exhaust. So from this point to this point, both valves should be fully closed and fully sealed. So there's a point where they're both open and there's a point where they're both fully closed. And you just need to understand, most people think, you know, bottom dead center, okay, exhaust valve opens or intake valve opens. And then we bring it up here. Okay, at the top dead center, we're gonna stop. So they, they think of it in start, stop, start, stop. But it takes time to make all that happen. So that valve timing is critical. Manufacturers already set it. We're just trying to maintain it. Longer valve overlap is possible, produces greater torque, higher engines get more speeds and more boost pressure. So that comes from the turbocharger. They move into cylinder head bolts. Cylinder head bolts are what holds that head down. Most of them use specialized rolled threads that re and maintains, uh, retains main and rod bearing caps just like we talked about in the blog. The cylinder head bolts are going to be the same. Always inspect them before you use them. Many of our diesel engines have a torque to yield situation where they have you torque the bolt to a point where it starts to actually stretch the bolt and when you take the bolt out it doesn't actually shrink back. Those engines you have to replace the head bolts. So you want to make sure you read your technical manual when you're ordering parts to see do I need to order head bolts or not. 
because you don't want to get to the point you got everything clean it's all laid on the table you're like whew I'm ready to go you're putting it together and then you read the section on torquing and it says use new head bolts and you're like oh I gotta order head bolts and if you decide hey nobody's looking I'm just gonna take these old head bolts and put them back in you've torqued to yield you've stretched it it doesn't stretch back I put it in and I stretch it more you go beyond the yield point and you get past the elastic limit and then you're going to break it. And the bolt will actually stretch too far and it gets very weak. So the manufacturers figured out how to stretch it beyond the, the limit but not to the point where it actually will break. But you can't reuse those bolts. <laughs> so make sure you look ahead. Is my engine this type of head or is it not? So this particular engine's got six bolts per head. We've got a lot of force in that diesel engine. You typically have more bolts in the cylinder. Larger root diameter, so they're not, they're a little bit different looking bolts. You'll notice here it's wide and it narrows down and the threads typically will be out further. So they're not your standard, typical, conventional bolts. You don't even have that rounded edge up there towards the top of the head so it's not uh, there's no 90 degrees on it yeah this chamfer up here that's what you're talking about uh, radius so there's a radius up here to keep the 90 degree from being a point where you'd actually break so you wouldn't have a bolt that's damaged and say oh let's go to the bolt room and get a grade a bolt that's a nice big heavy duty bolt stick it in there you got to use the bolt for that manufacturer for that engine So thread damage, this could be from rust or it could be stretched. We have in our cabinet there, I forgot to get them out, a bunch of head bolts that they torque down. You want to read this, your technical manual and see when I put this bolt in, is this supposed to be dry? Am I supposed to dip it in engine oil? Am I supposed to put some special lubricant on it? What do I put on it? Because when I put oil on it, the torque value, the stretching, the clamping force, the resistance on it is much lower. So I'm going to stretch it more and the bolt's going to break. And so some manufacturers, you actually dip it in engine oil, put it in there and torque it down. Other ones, they have you spray it as dry, it's clean. So a clean, dry bolt, torque it in. If you don't do it right, you're going to stretch it. And what will happen is, Right where the threads start to end, it'll just start pulling the bolt apart and you pull it on and you look at it, the bolt will actually have a little narrowing in it. And this necking usually takes place down here in the threads where the bolt's just actually pulling itself apart and that bolt's gonna break. If it didn't already break, it's gonna break. So if you're torquing it, you think, man, I'm putting a lot of torque on this and my torque wrench is not clicking. Instead of just keeping going, back it out again and see if it's starting to actually get narrow. Because you're real close to having to like figure out how to get a broken bolt out of your head or your block. And that's not a fun thing. If the bolt has pitting, any kind of rust damage, you got corrosion, that's going to affect its ability to stretch. So any kind of corrosion in any place, you'd want to replace them. So there are times where a head bolt, part of the head bolt is in a dry cavity. Sometimes moisture can work its way down into that cavity. You pull it apart and there'll be a bunch of rust on there. You want to replace those bolts. Clean all the rust out, clean all the garbage out, and then replace the bolt. Don't use the old bolt. I've never had one of these go, no go gauges. These are checking to see if your bolt is stretched. And so if I'm doing a lot of these, some manufacturers may provide this. I don't know. And so you just lay it on there. Has the bolt actually measure longer than it's supposed to? And what that tells you is it's stretched. You've, gone, you've stretched it beyond and it hasn't gone back. So it's beyond its elastic limit. So. Turn torque. Torque to yield, not torque to yield, but this is a, uh, there's a name for it when you, you take a torque wrench, put your bolt in there, bring it up to a certain torque, and then you use an angle torque. 
So they'll either say flats go to 120 foot pounds and then go one flat more. Or they'll say go to an angle, go 20 degrees more, go 120 degrees more. They'll give you an, a number, an angle. And they have angle torque gauges that you stick on, you put your torque wrench on, and then you're gonna go till you hit that point and then go so many degrees more. Both of those are getting your initial preload on with the torque wrench and then you actually turn it several degrees, flats, or so many turns. And so usually it's degrees or flats that they have you go. And what you're doing is you're stretching it to its, its elastic limit and you're not to the yield point. And so that's a, I think they call it torque to yield is what the method's called. But you torque it to a certain click and then so many angles. I want you to go 90 degrees from that point. And you need to figure out how to do that. There are instruments that you buy that you can measure it to make that happen. And you're gonna have some applications have studs, some applications have bolts. There's all kinds of variations. You kind of follow the same method for all of them. Head gas can be a replacement. Uh, they're going to get into valve uh, head, head gasket materials. There's all kinds of different materials out there. Typically you don't have a choice. My manufacturer or my head has this head gasket. You wouldn't try to use other manufacturers. They know what their expansion and contraction rate is. You don't use two gaskets ever. That changes things up because you machined it too much. Let's put two head gaskets. That's just a disaster waiting to happen. You want to use one gasket. A lot of times it'll be this side up and it'll be printed on there or stamped in there. Make sure you have the, the right side up. Very rare will they make the head gasket in such a way that you can actually put it on any way but the correct way because it's critical and they don't want you to mess it up. If I'm, before I got my engine apart, I could use some kind of a die in the system and kind of check for leaks. Once I have it off, if I'm looking for cracks, they have this die penetrant where you actually put some dye on there and the dye will go into a crack and it'll actually help sh uh, show cracks up easier. They also have this process called Magniflux. You put electric, you put this tool on there that's actually putting an electrical current through the head. And so it's got this big bar, you stick it on and then uh, they sprinkle something on the uh, metal shavings on there and if there's a crack because the electricity can't go through the crack it goes around the crack and you'll see it it's like jumps right at you so there's a crack and a lot of times you won't see the crack until you put this tool on there and it's, it's running electricity any place that there's a crack it changes the current flow through the block and then you'll see the crack you can pressure treat it testing. You can actually put, seal it all up, put pressure to it, see if we're leaking water or air somewhere, look for bubbles. So if you suspect that you have a problem, you didn't find it with the head gasket, you didn't find it with anything else, you may be going through some other method to check to see, do I have a crack somewhere that's going from coolant to oil, or oil to coolant, or combustion chamber to coolant, combustion chamber to oil. So there's multiple ways it can go. So if you don't find the obvious, like we did on that Toyota, not Toyota, but the Kubota engine. I mean, this Kubota engine, I don't know that we had that on film, but this Kubota engine here, this crack was really obvious. It pretty much jumps out, this is all pitted, and the crack is extremely clear. We knew exactly where the crack was. We didn't have to do any of this stuff here. So tech tip, removing the cylinder heads, they talk about removing it to help reduce warpage. When I torque a head, I always torque it from the middle out. When you remove the head, you really should start from the outside and torque your way in. So we're going to use a crisscross pattern to go out and you want to start on the outside and crisscross your way in. If you start at one end and start opening it up, loosening it up, there are some times where it could actually alter or damage the, the head. So you just want to kind of make that a habit. Start on the outside and do a crisscross pattern, reverse of how you put it on. <clears throat> I take all the bolts out. It's stuck to the head. 
What you want to do is get a like an eight foot cheater bar, stick it under one end, put a big pipe on that and jump on it, see if it pops off. And if it doesn't, then look for the bolt that you forgot and then replace it because you bent it. So always start gentle. If you can't get it to kind of tap on it with a soft hammer or you can't get a pry bar and kind of gently wiggle on it and get it to pop free, look for the bolt that you missed. So the most common problem is there's a bolt on the inside somewhere that you don't see. And that happens a lot. So before you get real aggressive with the big cheater bar, look for the bolt that you missed. That's the obvious. And there are times where that head gasket and that head will stick pretty hard. And once you get it to pop, it just jumps off of there. But Start gentle and kind of work your way up from there. But taking a soft hammer and striking it, big sand hammer, you know, that usually will jar it. Put a little pressure and kind of wiggle it around. Put a little pressure here, put a little pressure here. Don't put a lot of pressure at one end and expect it not to bend up. So be gentle with that. <laughs> the most important seal in the engine is going to be that head gasket. It's one of the most troublesome areas, too. There are lots of different materials. Materials have changed dramatically over the years. This multi-layer type gasket is the newest style of gaskets that are out there, especially where we have cast iron and aluminum or whatever combination to dissimilar metals that are expanding at different rates. We want a material that's going to give but not actually tear and leak. And so this is Pretty much everybody has some kind of multi-layer gasket that's designed to deal with that expansion that's taking place. This is a multi-layer steel one, and they say in here that it allows the cylinder head to slide across the block without damaging the gasket from repeated expansion and contraction. So this is metal that's actually, when the engine's running, starts up, shuts down, it gets hot. It's trying to help that. <clears throat> we had a well, I still have my dad as a tractor that had a metal gasket. It's all metal like that, and it would blow all the time. And it didn't give very many hours and you'd blow a head gasket. So after blowing two or three, somebody suggested that he put copper spray on it. So we took copper spray paint, which has got copper flakes in it, and sprayed it on there and put it on and torqued it, and it's never blown since then. And so before we got to these new modern multi ones and they had metal ones that were all metal, that was a common problem where the metal would actually grip and tear and then leak. And so copper or aluminum spray paint because of the metal that was in it would help lubricate it and kept that seal together. Today's engines, that's not something we would do. If you're working on something old, that might be something to consider if you have a gasket that keeps blowing. I think it's been a long time since I had to uh, try that. <clears throat> Here's obviously a multi-layer one, lots of different stuff. It's got a layer in the middle that's kind of a rubbery, it's not really rubber, but it's designed to actually give so that the two surfaces can have a lot of movement in them. And here they're showing you an aluminum head with a cast iron block. Well, sometimes they really, they got to be able to compensate for all that movement. So you just make sure you get the right gasket, put it on. And you will never reuse the same gasket twice. You put it on, you torque it. Oh, I forgot to put the pistons in. Okay, so you got to take it back off. You need to buy a new gasket. That gasket's been crushed. And when it crushes, it forms to that application. And you pretty much have to buy a new one. Most of our gaskets have that graphite material on it and when you clamp it down, when you take it back off, it just rips and this, this separates with it <coughs> and you got to buy a gasket. And that could be $300 to buy a new gasket. Our head gaskets for this two Toros you guys are working on, one was $166 and one was $143 for a little three-cylinder head gasket. So they're not Real cheap. Leaking head gasket causes cylinder compression to leak into the cooling system. So it could be it could be combustion into cooling. It can be combustion into oil. It can be 
oil into cooling, it can be cooling into oil. I mean, there's lots of combinations that you have. This particular example, they're actually pressurizing something and seeing where the system comes. Uh, I had a John Deere tractor that we were getting water in the oil. Dipstick, you looking and uh, what's going on? And so we tried to pressurize the cooling system, finally pulled the pan off, and that's the cylinder line that you see that pitting. It pitted all the way through the liner, and you pull it off, and I could see at the bottom of the pan there was a rust spot where the water, when the tractor sat, it would drip and actually created a rust spot on the pan. And then you went right above it, sure enough, there's where it was pitting. We thought at first it was the oil cooler. So you have an inner cooler that cools the engine oil. So the oil goes up into this antifreeze thing that is running antifreeze and cooling the oil. That was the common thing. So the most common problem with that tractor was the inner cooler. We pulled it off, we pressurized it, there was no leaks. The next most common was the expensive problem is what we had. And so we ended up engine apart, all new liners, all new pistons, new rings, new gaskets, all that kind of stuff. It was expensive. All because they ran straight water and pitted to the liner. The other film that we did, we talked about here's a straight edge, take gauge, he's checking the seas or any place on this head that you have whatever the tolerance in your book is, which is usually not more than two pretty uh, narrow. You're going to do it in an X pattern from corner to corner and then end to end and then I usually do it side to side because as you've seen from our example there is there. Oh. I, I should see that when I do my X pattern but. Well wouldn't there be a, well I guess it should be the same if you put your feeler gauge If you're measuring like a quarter of the way down the horizontal line, you're going to get half of the distance of measurement that you would normally get. Book.
You're gonna have to start streaming. So let's take a break. So we can check if you start getting coolant, you can actually put a tool that goes on the top and it's got like a clear tube that goes on and we can actually look for bubbles. So if you start seeing bubbles coming out, you know that you have combustion pressure going into the system. So it's pretty easy to check for that system. You can actually put a dye in there, the in gas engine, you can put a dye in there and it detects the stuff that's in it. You can't do that with a diesel. Your book talks about that. And you can also do an analysis. You can take a coolant analysis, send it into a lab, and they'll show, hey, there's carbon deposits and that kind of stuff in it. But most of the time, I got milky oil or I got bubbles coming out of my radiator. The, the Toro fairway mower, the student drove by me and I could smell antifreeze. I lifted the hood and the overflow tank was kind of foamy and kind of running out the overflow as it were. It's like, oh, whoa, shut this thing down. I mean, we knew we had a problem right there. So it just it was pretty simple. What I use to check for the coolant leaks is I have a cooling system pressure gauge. So I'll put that on the radiator sometimes and I just have a gauge and hang it up and start the engine. And if I see the gauge starting to bounce, then I know I have a, a leakage. And if the gauge bounce follows engine RPM, then I know it's definitely tied to the one of the So there are various ways of doing it. Most of the time, it's going to be so obvious that you don't have to do a lot of testing for it. So gear train mechanisms, they talk about valve timing. We already talked about valve timing, valve chains, valve belts, that kind of stuff. High torsional vibration, forces of a diesel engine means greater gears and chains. So the gears and the chains are going to be heavier duty because we have a lot more stuff to deal with it. And so all components are going to be more durable. So. Rear mounted gear chain. So, this is one of those. So, they're trying to reduce noise by moving things around in the engine, trying to get them to get less noise in it. And this is that scissor gear that we looked at in the other slide and the Duramax. And that's it. So, let's go back to Scott's. And we'll zero in on this. So while we were trying to talk, he was trying to make noise for us. So I don't know if that helps us. But we have the top. He cut this at 30 degrees. And all we have is this little teeny 45 degree left. So... You haven't laughed it or anything, right? No, not yet. That's why I left the twist. So at this point, we've cut the top at 30 degrees. Now we have a real narrow 45, which we want to be 20 to 43 thousandths. So we'll measure real quick to see. We're on metric here. I don't want to be up. There we are. Okay. So to get my 30 to 40. Too far, 17. Right there is 34, so we're around 34. So 34 is in between our 20 to 43, so we should be good. Now the question is, where does it hit? Is it going to hit right here a third of the way down? Is this where that is going to contact or is it going to contact too low on my valve? If it's too low on my valve, then we took too much off the top and should have done a 60 degree at the bottom. So we'll know that when we lap this now, we'll figure out where that's at. So that'll be the next step. But that's a two angle grind. Okay. And I did it on both of them. Though. So the other thing I want to show, we'll go across the page here, and this is just some valve grinding equipment. 
So this is products by new way. So instead of using a stone, which is a very common way of grinding, this is machining by um, using some sort of cutter that's using a, a carbide cutter. And you can see different tools available. Here we have a lapping thing. So we talked about hand lapping. We've got this one, which is a mechanical electric motor. This is a valve face cutter. So this is a valve cutter here. So we have a, a large one. This is a nice, small, cheaper version than buying a big Sioux one that we'll look at at the very end down there. And you can see we have lots of different pilots. We have lots of different cutter shape sizes from real small to really large. And there's lots of different kits that you can buy to do this particular thing. And we'll see some more kits when we get down. The next one here is just one kit that's available. So when you buy a Briggs & Stratton kit, you know, it comes with a couple of seat cutters and a couple of pilots. You got the T-handle, you have the brush to clean it with, the uh, hex key to actually loosen up and slide this back and forth. These carbide tips are replaceable, so if they got damaged for some reason, you can replace them, buy new ones. They will always be flat. That's the nice thing about this style, is I never have to worry about where a stone will actually wear in the stone. These never wear. The stones, the carbide piece is always flat. So you're always left with a perfectly flat surface. The next one is just an example of the valve cutter. So instead of using a stone to cut it, which the stones wear, this one is using a carbide insert. There's three sides to it, so if one was wear, worn down, you can just rotate it, and then it's replaceable. So I'm actually machining the valve smooth rather than grinding it smooth. So I'm going to leave it with a perfectly smooth surface that's not ground with a stone. Should be more accurate and should leave you with a better grind. <clears throat> so going down, this is just a, instead of using, you want to hand me that? So using our speed wrench, so we're using a speed wrench to lap that valve in. They're using this easy turn wrench. So I would use a speed wrench rather than waste money on that thing. The next one down is how do I know that my valve is actually not bent? Because a bent valve could cause some of the problems that we've seen on our two examples that we showed you. And so this one here, we put it in there and we spin the valve and just make sure that the valve is actually perfectly straight. Moving down, you can see that we have kits available. So this one here is a general motorcycle kit. This is for Harley Davidson, BMWs. This one here is a Japanese kit. And so they sell kits that come with all the different pieces that are out there. So Yamaha, Kawasaki, then you get over here and you're like, well, how much do they cost? That's a great idea. Then you look here at the prices. So you got 4000 2000 $200, $200. So here's our general import. Honda Auto Kit, $600. Saab Auto Kit, $500. Here's our Harley Davidson motorcycle kit, $700. So the kits kind of cover everything in their brand but the kits also could be used for other things. So you don't have to buy every single one of these kits. But you can see if you start buying a lot of different kits, you're going to spend a lot of money on valve grinding equipment. The thing is, if you don't have this style, then you're going to go to the stone style. So this one here is a Sioux. So a Sioux is what we have. We have a larger grinder it's using a grinding stone instead of using a machining process we're using a stone to grind our valves and then the valve seats we're going to be using a round stone you have to actually machine the stones keep them flat all the time kind of dress them all the time and then you have lots and lots of stones so our cabinet when you open it up it has rows of stones and the stones come in various sizes shapes and actual material. So you have all these different tools. These are the tools that you use to run the stone in and out. This tool down here is what we dress the stone with. 
kits. They have various kits. Here's our brushes that we would clean our valve guides with. Here's the tools that go on the top, and then the stone is attached to these tools. No matter what you do, you have a lot of money in tools. Pilots, we seen the pilots when we were lapping our, grinding our valve seats, and it's, there's lots and lots of pilots, lots of diameters. And so when you start buying all these, it starts to add up fast. And then we get into reamers. If you actually want to machine your valve guide out, there's reamers that you ream it. You can put new inserts in. So there's a whole bunch of tools to do that kind of stuff. Here's some various types of stones, small valve seats, standard um, iron steel. So there are multiple different kinds of stone. If you have a hardened seat versus a soft seat, there are different stones to cover that. So you gotta be aware that not just you're not just gonna buy one. Here's a kit that has a lot of variety in it. So you can actually have a lot of money tied up just trying to grind valves. Most manufacturers don't recommend that you even grind the valves. Most of them say if the valve is worn, buy a new valve. Well, that helps deal with the valve, but what do I do with the seat? I still need to do something with the seat. I need to be able to clean up the seat. And that's where I find that the new waste system, because I can move that in and out, I have a little more variety and I can cover a lot more uh, options out there. So, did you lap this one? Yeah. Okay, so I'm gonna hold this here. So here he lapped the valve into that piece and our gray area is way down here. So I'm actually, if I reversed it, would be ideal. I want this gray strip to have as much gap on the top. I really want this distance on the top and this wide part at the bottom. So we cut too much at the 30 degree and we moved it too far down. So it's not very ideal really. So that's where you want to cut a little bit and then check it, see where it's touching. We want to be one, uh, kind of one third. So come down one third. Here we're like two thirds and less than a third. So our, our contact area is, is too far in. So it's too low. So we'll have to address that. So here's his other valve. This one here is better. This one has a smaller amount on the top side and a lot wider on the bottom side. This one here is actually pretty acceptable. Whereas this one is a little too far the other way. So we'll leave this one. This one we may play with to see what we can do. The easiest thing going to be to do is cut the 45 a little bit more. When you cut the 45 it's going to grow towards the outside. So we'll cut it with 45. If we need to, we'll do a 60 to bring the middle in, but <clears throat> we'll try just taking a 45 to it and, and go from there. Okay? That's not everything about valves, but it's a good start and it's a good launching into that. So that's chapter five. five.